Okay. So uh, welcome to another little blog post reading from my side. I'm Max Kautmacher and I'm here with in my student initiative for open science. Um, cozy, cozy living room, if you will. And uh, today I'm going to read a text for you, which probably which is probably interesting for a lot of students, not only those who are interested in open science, but basically any student who reads academic literature and who wants to know the fine differences of um, between studies, between good studies, between bad studies. And this is exactly what, what this text here is about. And the title is, What Makes the Study Credible? Psychology Edition. And uh, today I will do it a bit differently. I will uh, share my screen with you so that you can have a look at the figures which I will present um, instead of just looking at good old boring me on my face while I'm reading the, the text and so that you can just follow a bit better. So there are studies of varying quality. Obviously, you want to take your information only from the high quality studies. But how to differentiate between studies? Here are some tips on what to look out for when assessing what's a good study and what's a bad one. As a psychology student, sooner or later, you will hear about the replication crisis. To sum up some core evidence, we begin where it hurts. The Open Science Collaboration, or short OSC, found in 2015 a pooled replication rate of 36% when looking at 100 social and cognitive psychology studies. Effect sizes of the replicated findings were reduced by 51%. When differentiating between psychological fields in the Open Science, co science Collaboration data and using a p-value below 0.05 in the replication study as a criterion for successful replication, 25% of the social and 50% of the cognitive psychology findings replicated. And that's what we see on the, on the left two panels here of this figure. We see the OSC social psychology studies and the uh, cognitive psychology studies, and then uh, OSC all studies, that's the pooled evidence of both of those. Additionally, Schirmack uh, in, estimated in 2020 the replicability of social psychology to be between 20 and 45 percent. So that's a bit more of a, of a range. It could be a bit lower than estimated by the OSC. It could also be higher. So combining these 100 replications by the Open Science Collaboration with 207 other replications of various projects conducted in the recent decade, it looks a little better. 64% of, of the studies replicated, but effect sizes were reduced by 32%. The outstanding question is, which findings can be trusted? This is important because we would like to do research that produces reliable knowledge and interventions that actually work. For example, it would be nice to be sure that concentrated efforts to reduce racism are actually making a difference. There are many different ways to assess the quality of a given study and a one size fits all guide would be too simplistic. However, as a start, here is a list with some helpful points to look out for. The first one is inspect the study's basic idea. Most articles are built upon one or several basic ideas. Those might be causal effects eventually articulated in pre-existing theory or simply curiosity to observe an expected phenomenon. Many ideas which were thought of as weird have led to scientific breakthrough. Pick and choose from the Ig Nobel Prizes, for example. Others may be just weird ideas. If the idea is too strange to be true, you might be right to get suspicious. For example, seeing into the future is presumably highly, a highly unlikely skill. Still, studies have been published, for example, by BEM in 2011, seeming to support empirical evidence for psychic skills in university students. Luckily, some research got suspicious and questioned the alleged published evidence. 
And the result of investigating such evidence, namely BEM's finding, were saddening as they suggest the use of questionable research practices or QRPs. BEM simply reported too many findings just below the magical P equals 0.05 line, which is statistically extremely improbable. It is great to work with bold claims, but some things are too good to be true. Indeed, recent evidence suggested that the more surprising the original study's findings, the less likely they are to replicate. Now, the second point is the presented context. A good article should give a fair representation of the literature and allow for diverging ideas and discussions. More data is often better in order to get a broader understanding of the field, but sometimes authors fail to report important studies. That might give a skewed representation of the field, which can also influence the perception of the study's basic idea, which was the first point, but also the following points, um, which I will come to now in the following. That being said, it becomes clear that it's always better to read broadly when evaluating a study instead of blindly trusting the one uh, single study at hand. Okay. Now, um, clearly there are phenomena which are new, meaning there might not yet be much literature on the specific matter. And in that case, it is even more important to clarify concepts, definitions and operationalizations, and then uh, discuss the context of the study. A perfect example, and this is why I hopped now with the screen a little bit um, to show you this. Um, a perfect example where this did not work out is a paper which becomes known or became known as the hot crazy matrix paper. Uh, here the authors based the idea on a YouTube video and on a uh, mainly YouTube video but somehow social, um, socially mentioned um, phenomenon if, if you will which propagates sorting women into the hot crazy matrix which is the panel uh, displayed in the panel on the panel on the left uh, and men into the cute rich matrix which is uh, the panel on the right and this categorization into matrices was presented as a universal phenomenon in this paper and as big uh, noted in, in 2021 besides other issues this particular representation gives the impression that the hot crazy matrix is scientific consensus although there is no scientific evidence supporting the matrices. Hence, checking the literature the paper at hand is embedded in can pay off. However, only because there are many papers supporting a claim does not mean that they are of high quality, those claims or those papers. Replications of an effect in multiple studies can, however, give some more certainty if the study's methods are robust. In this case, it can be good to check who replicated the effect, and it is preferable to have different labs produce replications of the same effect. And the reason is that self-replications are problematic when the same questionable research practices are applied in the replication as in the original study. Now, the next point is hypothesis or, or several hypotheses. So the hypotheses are incredibly important as they tell you about the researchers intentions of what they wanted to test. Badly set up hypothesis should definitely be a warning sign. Bad hypotheses are unclear or cannot be measured. For example, sometimes Ryan and Chloe differ in liking eating eggs. A good hypothesis is specific and testable. For example, in the morning Ryan likes eating eggs better than Chloe. And in the evening, Chloe likes eating eggs more than Ryan. Another point is that it is important that hypotheses are not developed based on the same data on which they are tested. Um, so develop the hypothesis and then test it, not the other way around. Everything else would qualify as, as QRP. So what I just said, the other way around. This is the reason why you can call yourself surprised 
if the data should suggest the rejection of, the, of your null hypothesis, so when you have a p below 0.05, setting up hypothesis after the results unknown would not be surprising, no matter what the outcome is. This has been nicely explained in a paper by Feynman already in 1988, describing the conversation with a colleague of his about the mentioned problem. And now I cite, it's a general principle of psychologists that in these tests they arrange so that the odds that the things that happen by chance is small, in fact, less than one in 20. And then he ran to me and he said, calculate the probability for me that they should alternate so that I can see if it is less than one in 20. I said, it probably is less than one in 20, but it doesn't count. He said, why? I said, because it doesn't make any sense to calculate after the event. You see, you found the pe peculiarity and so you selected the peculiar case. If he wants to test his hypothesis, one in 20, he cannot do it from the same data that gave him the clue. He must do another experiment all over again and see if they alternate. He did, and it didn't work. Now, to be sure that the hypotheses are not set up after the results are known, check whether the study was pre-registered. Surely there are plenty of studies which are not pre-registered, which did not apply QRPs and also pre-registrations do not necessarily protect from questionable research practices. However, QRPs seem to be less prevalent in pre-registered studies. And pre-registered studies seem to produce better estimates of effects than non-pre-registered studies. Now, the next section is the methods, or the next point to look at is, is the methods. So the method section usually starts with describing the participants. Just by looking at the participants' demographics, you will likely be able to draw some conclusions about the study's generalizability. If the authors look for an effect which is highly influenced, for example, by culture, it might be a good idea to conduct cross-cultural studies and so on and so forth. When looking at the procedures as the reader of the finished article, uh, strong ethical violations are unlikely to be visible. This is what ethics committees are for. However, there are a range of factors which can mess up the experiment and be unethical. For example, making participants uncomfortable with insensitive questions without being informed about the possibility that such questions could be asked in the consent form. Another problem is data collection methods, which deliver inaccurate results. For example, recording heart rate at a low sampling rate might produce uninterpretable uninterpretable results. The same applies for questionnaires which are not validated. It will be difficult to interpret the results as one cannot be sure what has been measured. Additionally, a research finding will only tell you as much as the measures allow. And uh, here I would like to show you um, this nice figure. So we uh, look at the difference between horses and crocodiles and yes, the, the, the answer to the problem is only as good as the questions we asked. Okay, so therefore make sure that validity statistics are reported. So to make sure that um, uh, um, the, the measures are, are okay. And those examples of um, um, reliability measures are um, McDonald's Omega or Cronbach's Alpha. And not only for, and that's um, not only for some of the scales, which you want to have those values for, but best for all of them, including the subscales because those give you good information about measurement error. And here I will show you a table. So taking Kronbach's alpha as an example there in the table, when having an alpha level of, for example, um, 
a Cronbach's alpha of um, 0.8, which lays within the, the range of values uh, which have been labeled acceptable. Uh, so here. Um, there's still um, 0.36 uh, random error, as you can see. And for the lower bound of this acceptability range, um, with an alpha, Cronbus alpha of 0.7, you have already a random error of 0.51. In other words, low reliability measures add noise to the data. So a uh, P below 0.05 uh, might not tell you much when measures are unreliable and sample size low. As also small effects, this can become significant when testing on noisy data. And finally, confounding variables can be a real headache as they can reduce the predictive power of a model. Maybe you can come up with a good confound when the model presented in the study is not fitting. Well, a great example here is the positive correlation between ice cream sales and homicide rates. I heard of this the first time on the Quantitative, uh, Quantitude podcast, very recommendable podcast. So eating ice cream does not increase violence. Uh, watch out, that's a correlation between ice cream and ice cream sales and violence. However, heat seems to do so, at least to a certain degree. Now, we should look at the analysis. So the first question we should ask is, were the right statistical procedures used? To be able to evaluate the findings of a study, it is important to understand the statistical procedures. It can surely happen that inappropriate statistical tests were applied or crucial steps not considered. For example, correcting for multiple testing. When testing often enough, you will observe significant findings by chance, even when there is no true effect. The second is, does the data processing make sense or were the data beaten until they gave in for P below 0.05? What is much more difficult to evaluate is whether questionable research practices were used. One cannot be sure whether all tests were reported and all data used if the study was not pre-registered. There should be a logical rational for data processing and the exclusion of outliers. Inconsistencies such as excluding participants without apparent reason should be a warning sign. The third point is, are the statistical tests sufficiently powered? So still psychology's biggest problem child is the power of statistical tests. Power refers to the probability of detecting an effect if there is a true effect present. Most tests in psychology are applied on small samples. Depending on the design, this can lead to low power. For example, in the mentioned differences in replication rates in the uh, open science collaboration study between social and cognitive psychology, that was in the beginning of the text, uh, is partly due to better power designs of the selected cognitive psychology studies. Now, here in this figure, uh, uh, there, is, um, there, there are two sensitivity analysis. Uh, the first one, which you can see right now, um, is using a um, two-tailed t-test uh, as a two-tailed two uh, paired samples t-test. So it's uh, an experiment ran within the group. And when I scroll down now, um, you see the uh, uh, two-tailed t-test um, between groups. Um, so that's a um, independent samples t-test. So assume we test 100 students and use common parameters in social psycholo psychological testing. We use 80% uh, power and an alpha level of 0.05, which brings us the magical P below 0.05 uh, we wish for. Running an independent samples t-test with equally sized groups, so that's 50 and, uh, 50 and 50 people, we will only be able to detect effects with a minimum uh, size of D, Cohen's D uh, equals 0.57. And 
that's the figure you, in the figure you see you see right now, uh, which is larger than the expected average mean effect size in social psychology, which is around uh, d equaling 0.4. And now, when we test the same hundred participants um, twice and run a paired samples t test with the same described assumption allows to take smaller effects down to a minimum of d equals 0.28, which you should see in the top uh, line, uh, still on the top panel of, uh, of, the, of the figure. So while many social psychology experiments compare between subjects, within subject designs seem to be more common in cognitive psychology. And that is not necessarily surprising because, for example, promising uh, priming a person, the same person twice in the same session does really make sense. Contrarily, testing how many digits participants can remember, for example, uh, four digits and then five and then six can be done with the same person. Additionally, when testing not only for differences, so main effects, between groups, but also differences between differences, so that's interaction effects, suddenly a multiple of the sample size is required to achieve appropriate power. Furthermore, low power does not allow to detect effect sizes over a certain threshold. Problematically, most journals strongly prefer to publish positive findings. As a result, negative results disappear into the file drawer to never see the light of day again. The result is a biased. Uh, the result is a biased literature, literature, or a we call that publication bias. And low power studies, study designs combined with reporting only significant findings can lead to a collection of inflated effects in the literature, which is even more problematic when questionable research practices are applied. And this is why most replication efforts produce smaller or no effects compared to the original studies. Now, what to make of this when looking at a paper? You can make a sensitivity analysis to calculate the maximum observable effect size based on the parameters in the paper in different programs, such as G power, which are used for the figure above or the figure you see right now. If the observed effect size is too high to be observed based on the power, it is inflated. For more on sample size justification and power, you can also um, see some, some of the contents Larkins, Daniel Larkins put out there. And I've uh, linked to that in the blog post. Now, the fourth point is, are there loads of p-values just below 0.05? So if a paper reports p-values from several studies, you can test whether their distribution is plausible by using this, the test of insufficient variance. So uh, it's short TIVA. But it is recommended to be used together with other variance tests. If there are sufficient results present in the literature and you want to be thorough, uh, you could run a P-curve or Z-curve analysis. Those plot the distribution of either p or z values to model an expected distribution of findings considering publication bias. And by doing so, you can often notice a spike in a distribution just below the golden p equals 05 line. Such bias of the literature suggests the application of questionable research practices. And here is this, is this graph. So <clears throat> here on uh, the top panel on the left, you see um, this would be the distribution of p-values when there's no uh, real effect. And when we have uh, p-hacking and other questionable research practices which screw the, design, uh, screw, screw the distribution, uh, then we suddenly have a lot of um, p-values just below 0.05. And this is the curve when there is a true effect. And the red line now shows how it then suddenly looks when there is, again, questionable research practices which are applied. And uh, there's a spike just below the P 
uh, equals 0.05 line. And th that's basically the same, which is show shown here on this right side, only that we don't know if, the, if those effects are real or not, and they are uh, based on actual data. So here um, in the top, we see 120 uh, psychology journals, um, um, uh, p-values, which were transformed into z-values. And uh, this, this line here shows um, the magical 0.05 line and just just below it there are a lot of a lot of values and that's um, here we can see that um, so most likely there are some studies were not reported or there were questionable research practices used and that's the same for the journal of consumer research in 2020 there it's very likely that questionable research practices were used or um, yeah, um, some findings were suppressed. One, one of one of both. And the more the more extreme this curve here looks, um, the more likely it is that some of uh, that that there are also questionable research practices applied. Now the next point is um, we have to look at the inferences. The most commonly made mistake in papers is that correlation is interpreted as causation. Probably the most prominent recent example is the now retracted article, the association between early career information, uh, informal mentorship and academic collaborations and junior author performance, which used repeatedly causal language describing correlations. Yet this is only one of many examples where verbal claims do not logically follow from presented inferential statistics. And hence, uh, Yaconi, uh, has stated in 2019 that psychological claims are often not generalizable and the field is in a generalizability crisis. So double check whether hypothesis and statistical tests align in a meaningful way and whether the conclusions drawn from both make sense. And then, then we can look again at this, uh, at this figure here with uh, the, is it a horse or is it a crocodile? Do the, do the conclusions actually uh, do the conclusions uh, make sense based on the data and, and yeah, do the, does the testing make sense uh, considering the question and so on. And often enough authors oversell their claims which gets the paper published. So watch out for that one too. An example is the overestimated influence of political bubbles or echo chambers. Um, yeah, so the conclusion here is um, that in this article, I presented a list of red flags and strategies which can be helpful to think about when assessing a paper's credibility, namely the basic idea, presented context, hypothesis, methods, analysis, and inferences. It clearly arises that a multitude of factors plays into the quality of a research paper, including information beyond the single paper. The procedure of assessing a paper's credibility can hence hardly be generalized, and there is always more to be learned when assessing papers. Nevertheless, with this article, or in this case, this video, I hope to provide a starting point for a critical reading of the literature. And here are some additional resources. I will link to the, to the blog post in the video, um, in the video materials. Thank you. <laughs>